Sheikh Ahmed waited impatiently for the sun to go down so that he could spend his first wedding night with his kept wife. His beloved Layla gave her cabal and his convoluted plan of getting her married to his chauffeur worked perfectly, furious wife aside. He phoned the Pakistani doctor and confirmed that Sabir Ibrahim Shah was rendered totally sexually impotent. After hugging his Layla for the first time in the kitchen, he helped her to stand. Then, in front of his sons and playing his role to the hilt, he led Rehana by the hand to her room. His sons and his chauffeur followed them silently. The two sons were very much touched by the fatherly affection their father showered upon their beloved maidservant. If not for his sons shadowing them, Kays would have carried his Layla in his arms to their wedding suite and begun enjoying her. Reaching the room, Sheikh Ahmed sat Rehana on her bed. He insisted that she lie down on the bed and rest. The bride followed his request and lie on the bed motionless and in shock. While the lovely bride was laid out on the queen-sized bed in her beautiful wedding gown, Sheikh Ahmed whispered in her ear. He promised that his wife would not bother her any more. Seeing her lying there aroused the crazy old man to a heightened passion and desire such as he had never felt before. Ever the strategist, he knew that it was just a matter of time until his life's dream would come true. Just before leaving, he gave Ifit a sweet fatherly kiss on her forehead. All this time, Ifit was sitting in the bedroom playing with her beautiful new Barbie dolls. She returned from school an hour before her mother came back. The little daughter was allotted a small room near her mother's room. It was the old man who made that arrangement for the daughter of his maidservant. He didn't want the little daughter to be there when he comes to have sex with her mom. Meanwhile, Mrs. Ahmed, not knowing what was about to transpire, had fed her well and told her to go play with her dolls in her room. After that Sheikh Ahmed along with his sons and the paper husband left Rehana's room and went and sat in the living room. They talked to each other in whispers. They did not want to risk provoking the angry lioness. The measure of her fury led them to believe she might just spring out of her bedroom at any moment and attack them or run to the maidservant's room and kill her. Hisham and Husam peppered their father with questions. How did you find Rehana? Why did you suggest they marry? In general, they were happy about the marriage. They knew that Rafiq didn't always sleep in their house. He had to follow their father from house to house and stayed with him wherever he went. So, it was clear to them that they could still blackmail the chauffeur's wife for sex. The biggest problem they faced was that they did not have the key to Rehana's new room. They were already planning to steal the key and make a copy. The events did nothing to change their interest in the maidservant sex, videotapes, and showing off in school. Sheikh Ahmed waited many hours for his wife to come out of their bedroom and talk to him. He regretted that he had challenged her. He knew that if she left the house and returned to her father's house he would be in some serious trouble. Half of his business came from her wealthy father. Therefore, to avoid any problems, Sheikh Ahmed shrewdly decided to compromise. He decided to accept her decision and send Rehana and her daughter to the house of his third wife. No matter what, the marriage between the chauffeur and the maidservant would remain valid. He would not agree to force Sabir to divorce Rehana. When his wife did not come out until the evening, he took it upon himself to go to her bedroom and try talking to her. Mastura was lying on her back when her husband came in. Her eyes were wide open, staring at the ceiling. When she heard him entering the bedroom she averted her eyes and fixated on him. Her eyes were the gateway to hell. He sat beside her and tried to touch her. She pushed his hand away and stood up. Then. She marched out of the bedroom, headed to the living room and sat down. Her sons had already gone to their rooms and the chauffeur was nowhere to be found. She became more outraged when she visualized her secret lover and sex satisfier having sex in her house with that dirty Indian slave. Thoughts of stabbing Rehana still clouded her mind. Her husband came and sat in front of her, trying to engage her in conversation. Once again, she ignored him and remained silent. Through her silence,
he apologized and promised to send Rehana and her daughter to his third wife's house. Her face revealed to him that his apology and compromise had done nothing but make her even more furious. Nothing could quench the boiling anger in her heart and the flaming fire in her eyes save sending her rival to the grave or to jail. Sheikh Ahmed sat more than two hours in front of his wife and tried patiently to get his wife to talk, but he could not make any headway nor pacify her. She seemed to have gotten stuck in a sullen and sulky mood. Finally, he decided it was best to leave her to cool off by herself and talk to her tomorrow. He got up from the couch and went to his bedroom. He changed his clothes and put on his nightdress. He had wanted to rest for some time, tired by the exertion of the day's activities. He fully expected his wife to return to bed once she got sleepy. Tired of trying to appease her, he was resigned to stay put and he began to imagine the great enjoyment and pleasure awaiting him on his first wedding night. He was determined not to close his eyes. He was afraid that due to his advanced age, he might fall asleep and miss the splendor of his first wedding night with his latest wife. He enjoyed imaging how he would approach his beloved. He asked himself, what should he do first to her? Should he take her in his arms and hug her for a long time or should he start kissing her immediately on her lips? Should he remove her clothes piece by piece or ask her to undress herself? And when she became ready to consummate the union, which position should he assume? Should he do it doggy style or missionary style? He knew that in his advanced age he would not be able to do anything too strenuous. He told himself that he should just ask his beloved to climb on top of him and do it her way. He thus preferred the cowgirl position. The crazy old man was so lost in his fantasies that his mouth was ajar with a trickle of drool running down the side of his face. Suddenly, the old man stopped his daydreaming and looked at his watch. He began to worry about his first wedding night. He checked his watch intermittently. Each passing second made his heart beat faster. His wife was not back. Worried that things were not going according to plan, he jumped out of bed, cracked the door open and peered at her. She was sitting exactly as he had left her, stationary, like an alabaster statue. He now regretted trying to talk to her in the bedroom. If he had anticipated that she would come out and sit in the living room, he would not have tried to placate her. Now she was sitting like a night watchman, and there was no way he could go to his kept wife's room without passing directly into her line of fire. From where she was sitting, she had an eagle's eye view of the maidservant's room. The old man now had a serious problem. He went to his bed, sat for some time, returned to the door and peeped out again. His wife was still sitting motionless in exactly the same spot. He felt like doing something rash like taking a knife and scaring her. Divorce her and send her home to her father tonight. However sanity returning, he calmed himself down and fidgeted, waiting impatiently for his wife to tire and come to bed. Checking again, his wife was still in the same position, looking blankly at the wall. A thought flashed in front of his restless mind and gave him a glimmer of hope. It looked like his wife had fallen asleep sitting upright. He made his way as quietly as he could and slowly as possible into the living room. Looking into her eyes, he saw anger shooting like a lightning bolt of thunder and he was struck dead to his soul. He tried to reason with his wife and convince her once again to come to bed. She just ignored him and continued to look at the wall. Begging her one last time and not getting any response at all, he gave up made his way back to the bedroom and fell asleep at 4.30 a.m. The following morning, Sheikh Ahmed's sleep was disturbed by the last person he expected to see. His wife pulled him up out of bed, her face radiant and happy. She could not hide her joy. She was laughing hysterically to the point where she could not talk. Sheikh Ahmed thought that he was dreaming the unattainable dream. His mind informed him that the woman who woke him up while she was bubbly and laughing could not possibly be his wife. Even if heaven rained down gold and silver, his angry wife would not suddenly change overnight. She shook him over and over again and laughed hysterically. By now, 
he was fully awake and convinced that this was indeed no dream. He had no choice but to accept the unavoidable fact that this cheery and jovial woman was none other than his wife. To him, it looked as though she had lost her senses due to emotional trauma. His first reaction was to slap her. Some people believe a powerful slap is the remedy for sudden madness. So, Sheikh Ahmed lifted his right hand as far as possible and struck his wife on her cheek. Mrs. Ahmed shocked back to normal reverted back to being the angry cobra woman and shouted at her husband, Go and slap the Indian prostitute that you have brought to me from the streets. Go and see who has come to take her away. Sheikh Ahmed was so troubled when he heard the tone of her challenge. It frightened him to hear her say, Go and see who came to take her away. He asked her in fear and trembling, Who has come to take Rehana away? The Jeddah policemen have come and arrested her. They are waiting to talk to you before they take her away. If his wife had brought a knife and severed his heart, Sheikh Ahmed would not have felt so much pain. His body became so hot it was if someone had set it on fire. He began to murmur unintelligibly. He tried to stand but his feet failed him. His wife helped him stand with much difficulty and assisted him until she managed to bring him out. The sight of four policemen standing in the living room greeted his eyes. He saw his beloved Layla in chains. Instead of asking them why Rehana was arrested his eyes were begging the policemen to have mercy on him and release his kept wife. One of them spoke to him in a harsh voice and said, This woman is a professional prostitute. She goes around the city cheating men, getting them to marry her and eventually she robs them of their money and runs away. In less than ten days, she deceived two men and married them. Here are copies of her two marriage certificates. One marriage certificate is with an Indian man by the name of Aslam Ali Khan and the second marriage certificate with a Pakistani man by the name of Sabir Ibrahim Shah. Sheikh Ahmed could not take the impact and shock of what he had heard and fell on the couch and fainted. Rehana Khan was arrested with the most serious crime ever committed in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. No one had ever committed this crime in this manner before except for an adulterous Sudanese woman. The Sudanese woman was married and had a husband in Sudan and also got married to another man in Saudi Arabia without divorcing her first husband. When her case came to the attention of the Saudi authorities, she was arrested, tried, convicted, and stoned to death, on a Friday of course. The evidence against Rehana was overwhelming. The police had found out that she got married to an Indian and then a Pakistani, a few days later. Marital law in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia stipulates that any foreign couple getting married should have a copy of their marriage certificate sent to the Ministry of Religious Affairs. Likewise, any married couple getting divorced are required to do the same. In the case of Rehana, there was no proof of a divorce from her first husband. Even if a divorce certificate would be produced later the Sharia law would not allow a divorcee to remarry until she waited three months and ten days. Rehana's crime became more serious after the Jeddah police sent her for the pregnancy test. The result of the test showed that she was six weeks pregnant. It means that she was impregnated by a third man. She had to produce proof of her marriage with the man who impregnated her and further prove that he had divorced her before she married the other two men. When she failed to produce the needed documents, the Jeddah police concluded that she was indeed a professional prostitute whose business was cheating men out of their money while sleeping with them under the cover of marriage. When Sheikh Ahmed came to senses and regained consciousness, he heard the charges against Rehana. He knew that his beloved was going away forever and never to return to him again. He understood that she was going to be stoned to death for these serious crimes. His happiness and joy overnight were turned into the deepest gloom and sorrow. He had spent a lot of money and had done many things to get his beloved woman but it was just not meant to be. Everything was in vain. He could not enjoy his Layla even once. He cried in front of his family members. His sadness and tears now exposed his true feelings. For the first time, his wife and children understood how deeply he loved the maidservant. On the other side, Mrs. Ahmed was openly rejoicing and celebrating her victory. 
She thanked her Allah a million times for seeing her tears and hearing the cries of her deeply pained and wounded heart and avenging this great wrong done to her. When she saw her secret lover beside the young and beautiful Indian maid servant, she thought she had lost him forever. But suddenly, her Allah had snatched him from the arms of the enemy slave and by the grace of Allah, returned him to her. Once again, the Pakistani chauffeur was to be her lover and hers alone. As she had wept silently throughout the night, she now rejoiced and celebrated all the day long in the preconceived thought that she was going to rejoice forever and ever. Rehana's serious crime filled all the newspapers and the media in Jeddah and spread all over the entire kingdom of Saudi Arabia, even to the OPEC countries. In a short time, even the international TV channels like the Arabic BBC in London, UK, and the Al Jazeera TV in Doha, Qatar covered the case. The Jeddah police was able to lay hands on Aslam Ali Khan and interrogate him. Aslam was found hiding in the city of Riyadh. After his failure to hand over his wife to his wealthy Saudi client, Aslam ran away from Jeddah and was hiding in the city of Riyadh. The Pakistani friend that provided him shelter revealed his whereabouts to the police. The media spotlight led Aslam's Pakistani friend to become an informant. He had read about the sensational case and knew the friend he was sheltering was no doubt involved in one of the most serious crimes ever committed in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. When Aslam was taken into custody, his friend called the local newspapers and told them he was the good citizen who revealed the hiding place of the first husband of the adulterous Indian woman. His 15 minutes of fame was realized when media men came and knocked on his door for his statement. According to Aslam's confessions, he admitted that he married Rehana Khan legally, according to the Sunnah of Allah and his messenger. She stayed with him in his apartment in Jeddah for one week. He slept with her many times during those seven days. He said further that he did not divorce her. One particular morning, he took her to a Filipino beauty salon and when he returned after two hours he found out she had run away with another man. She did not even bother to leave a note. He searched for her everywhere, but could not find her. She went to his apartment in his absence and stole all his savings and disappeared from his life. He was now totally broke after she robbed him of all his money. Aslam was detained for 24 hours and released. The police did not find him guilty of any crime. Likewise, the police took into custody the second husband and interrogated him. Sabir also confessed that he had married Rehana Khan in good faith. He did not know that she had another husband. She did not tell him that she had a previous husband who did not divorce her. He just saw her in the house of his sponsor and liked her. Then, he asked her to marry him and she agreed immediately. He also claimed that he married her and consummated the marriage the very same day. Sabir was released the following day too. The police was able to gather more incriminating evidence against Rehana. The airport police reported that Rehana and her daughter smuggled themselves inside the country without passports. Somehow, she managed to run away from the police and enter the city. For almost two months, she lived in the kingdom as an illegal alien. The accumulated charges led the police to take her sponsor into custody for questioning. Sheikh Ahmed denied his knowledge that his Indian maidservant and her daughter had arrived in the country without their passports. He claimed falsely that his Indian client in Bombay phoned him and informed him about the arrival of his maidservant and her daughter. When his maidservant and her daughter came to his house they had their Indian passports. He even handed over the two passports to the Jeddah police. He showed copies of the visas that he sent to his client in India. Jeddah police could find no reason to detain Sheikh Ahmed and so let him go. For the crazy lover, it appeared that his great love had suddenly turned into a mere lusting after a young beautiful woman who was as young as his granddaughter. When his beloved woman was charged with one of the most serious crimes ever committed in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, he washed his hands of her and had already begun to think of finding another young Indian woman to purchase. The only one that was happy at the Indian maidservant's fate, of course, was Mrs. Ahmed. She rejoiced and celebrated, shouting joyfully from the rooftop.
She waited eagerly for her husband to go to his other wives so that she could rebuke her secret lover and reclaim her place in the heart of her sex satisfier. Sheikh Ahmed began to hate his fourth wife for her continuously reminding him that he had brought a prostitute home. So he left her, if anything, just to get some peace of mind. His heart was filled with a mixture of anger and sadness toward Rehana. Mrs. Ahmed demanded that her husband either send the daughter of the Indian prostitute to her country or to the jail where her mother was waiting for her execution. When he refused to carry out her demands, she asked him to take her to live with one of his other three wives. Sheikh Ahmed did not know what to do with little Ifit. Staying with wife number four was not an option. He decided to take her to live in the house of one of his other wives. until he could hand her over to the Indian consulate for her to be deported to Bombay. As soon as her husband took the daughter of the maidservant and left, Mrs. Ahmed brought her candles and invited her lover to the house. The excuse to her husband was that she needed him to take her to the supermarket. In Saudi Arabia, a correctional police officer would not arrest a woman who was found in a car with the chauffeur of her husband. The police might demand some proof that the driver of the car was actually the chauffeur for the family. Anyway, the happy woman spent more than an hour in the washroom. She applied henna on her hands and legs as if she was a bride prepared for her bridegroom. She cleaned her body and removed every strand of hair from her legs, arms and hands. She even shaved clean the hair covering her private area and underarms. To top it off, she painted her nails and brushed her hair. She applied lipstick on her thin lips and put coal on her eyelashes and eyebrows. Coal eyeliner is an eye cosmetic, which mostly used by Muslim women but some Muslim men used it too because the Prophet Muhammad used to apply on a regular basis coal in his eyes. The happy woman did everything she could to make herself look Rehana's age. She emptied almost half a spray container of costly Indian perfume on her clothes and body. She also put musk on her underarms and some private parts. Once again, musk is aromatic substances used as perfume by Muslim women but some Muslim men apply musk on their bodies because the Messenger of Allah used to apply musk on his body too. In fact, the Prophet of Allah said he loved two things, perfume and women. Oh my goodness, I forgot to mention that although henna mainly used by women some Muslim men apply it on their bodies because the Prophet Muhammad used to apply henna too. When her secret lover showed up, Mrs. Ahmed gave him a long lecture in the living room. She made him swear by Allah that he would never repeat what he did to her again. She demanded that he should place his right hand on the Holy Quran and promise allegiance of everlasting fidelity. After forcing him to repent in tears and took the oath of allegiance, she brought him to her holy chamber. Mrs. Ahmed for the first time, decided to allow her lover to enter her bedroom. Before that day, she believed whatever a Muslim woman did, she should do away from her husband's bed. She heard that the Muslim woman who cheated on her husband in their marital bed would have the angels of Allah cursing her night and day. Her lot in this life and the life to come would be same like the disobedient wife who refused to allow her husband sleep with her. The angels of Allah would curse her until the morning. However, that particular day, her victory made her ignore this commandment, Thou shall not fornicate in thy marriage bed, and so she took her lover to the bed of her husband. She was looking to maximize her self-indulgence and this risky move made her feel like this would give her the greatest amount of pleasure. Sabir was shocked when he saw they were going to be spending time in the master bedroom with beautiful candles and the sweet smell of perfume circulating in the air. He saw the biggest bed he had ever seen, the likes of which he had never seen before. There was a blue movie playing on the big screen just above the bed. Mrs. Ahmed asked her secret lover to remove her dress. While Sabir was removing her clothing, he was looking at the beautiful white girl who having sex with a young white guy. Mrs. Ahmed decided today to go the extra mile. She decided to imitate everything the young white girl was doing to her sex partner. She ordered her lover to remove his clothes and be like her. Mrs. Ahmed did many things differently this day. 
She was so overjoyed that she found herself singing vulgar Arabic song she learned from some Egyptian porn movies where the words go as, Nikni wa ifta kosi, Nikni fi kosi al muasal, Dokal zibak washrat tazi, Fuck me up and open up my virgin pussy, Fuck me up in my juicy pussy, And stick your dick and tear up my ass. She began to mirror the white girl on the screen. For the first time, she used her mouth on her Pakistani but things seemed not to work the way it did on the LCD screen. Her lover's genital organ was not responding to her tender manipulations. She tried and tried to stimulate him, but it was as if her secret lover could not feel her hands or mouth. She told him to keep his eyes glued on the screen. She knew that if he looked at her fully naked body, he would lose interest. Being practical, she was aware she was very skinny and ugly, with a face resembling a man rather than a woman. She had a nose as big as a spade. Sabir followed her express orders and kept staring intently at the goings-on on the screen. He liked and enjoyed what he was watching on the big screen, but his sexual organ remained cold and soft as if it did not belong to his body. Mastura thought the Pakistani man was no longer interested in her and that his heart was stolen by that Indian prostitute killing all his desire for her. She reflected that while she was sitting in the living room silently weeping with her heart bleeding inside her chest, her secret lover was sleeping with the Indian slave. She stopped what she was doing and began to question him. He denied her accusations. He swore by Allah that he had not touched Rehana. When he said he did not have sex with the Indian maidservant, she slapped his face. She absolutely refused to believe that he just slept by her side in bed and that they had done absolutely nothing. She demanded an explanation for his lack of response. When he could not give any acceptable reason, she hit him in the chest and shook him by the shoulders and then began to cry. He begged her to allow him to go, but she refused. She kept beating and punching him. She even grabbed him by his shoulders and bit him which caused him to scream out in pain. Mrs. Ahmed would have killed her secret lover if he had not managed to push her away at the right time. When she fell on the floor, he picked up his clothes and ran out the room. Mrs. Ahmed did not run after him. She remained on the floor and sat sideways beating her body and pulling out her thin graying hair like a raging lunatic. When she overcame her rage, Mrs. Ahmed swallowed her pride, went to the black guard, and forced him to sleep with her. Before that day, she used to look at him as a dirty, filthy black slave. She used to call him Kal and Zanji, the black negro. Her children called him on his face Abedana, our slave. Arabs consider every black person their slave. Moreover, they believe that the black man will remain slave even if he becomes the rich man in the world as the dog will remain dog even if it stops barking. Nevertheless, that day, Mastura considered her black slave her right hand possess and had sex with him.